I love prayer. It's one of the great joys and delights of being a Christian. But I also wish I was better at it, praying more, going deeper. And there's always been a little bit of struggle in my prayer life. I'm not one of those people who just found it easy, but it's a struggle that's always been worth it. And I hope that I never stop learning and growing in my prayer. I'm David Ingle, and I've been a pastor and preacher now for nearly 15 years. And I think I've come to realize that that's true for most of us, maybe including you. And so I'd like to invite you to join me on a journey, a journey in prayer together. And we'll take our lead from the disciples who asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. And each time we'll look at some of the ways in which he taught and modelled prayer for us, as well as hearing from some other people who've inspired me in my prayer. And as we go, we'll ask some questions. Why pray? What's the point of prayer? Why didn't God answer and how do I do it? And my prayer is that as we do, we'll not only pick up some tips and ideas, but also catch a glimpse of some of the glories and possibilities of prayer, allowing Jesus to teach us and inspire us in our prayers. If we're honest, I think one reason why many of us struggle with praying is that we don't really want to do it. It's not that we've got anything against it. Most of us think it's a good thing, even something we should do more, but we're just not that excited about it. And I think that's why this first question, why pray, is so important. And one of the things that I've noticed about the people who inspire me in prayer is that they are excited about it. And when I see that excitement and the vibrancy of their prayer lives, it's inspiring and I want to pray more too. And it seems that was also the case with Jesus's disciples. Luke tells us that they asked Jesus to teach them how to pray, just as he was finishing up praying himself. I think they saw him praying and realized, wow, I want that too. And what then follows is one of two places where Jesus taught the Lord's Prayer. Probably the most famous and wonderful teaching on prayer there's ever been. And we'll look at it a bit more in a moment. But first, I want to introduce one of the people who's inspired me in prayer. My friend, Esther Beckley. She's one of our trustees at Burning Heart and she's got lots of experience in church and ministry here in the UK, in California, where she grew up in Sierra Leone and lots of other places. But what stands out for me is that she's really excited about prayer and she does lots of it. Esther, thank you so much for agreeing to meet up to chat about prayer. Mm -hmm. You seem really excited about prayer. Um, Mm -hmm. Would you say that's true? Oh my goodness, that's very true. Like when somebody says, yeah, Esther, come on, let's let's talk about prayer. You don't have to do anything else, I'll be around. Because I love to talk about prayer. I love to encourage people to pray. Now, you say you pray every day. Yes. How long do you pray for every day? <laughs> well, I was living in California for a while, and we used to have this joke going around, Esther's not available before 11 a.m. And that was really true. Not because I prayed until um, that time, but what I would do is I would wake up very early. I used to be a night person. I would be up till, like two in the morning and I'll be like, but you know what somebody says, it's 11 p.m. I'm like, oh, the night is still young. Let's watch a movie till like 2 a.m. And then I was listening to a podcast. He kept going on and on about how important it was to wake up early in the morning. So as I drove in my car, I prayed, Lord, I want to be able to wake up early in the morning. The next morning, I woke up out of deep sleep, bang, strap, wake, 4.30. First, I rolled over in my bed and I thought, 4.30? what is going on? And then I remembered my prayer and I was like, I'm up, Lord, I'm up. (laughs) And so that began me waking up really early. So I'd wake up at 4.45 every morning. So I'll be there sometimes till like nine in the morning, 9.30 in the morning. And then I'll come out and my day would just be 
really brilliant. So, so, so you, you're, you're getting up just a little bit before five <laughs> and then you're praying until 9.30. Yes. So that's basically four hours of prayer every single day. Every single day, mostly. Sometimes if I have to get up early for some reason, like travel or something, it will be shorter. I mean, basically, I've read about people like you in Christian biographies, but I think you're the first <laughs> person I've met who four hours a day. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Esther really inspires me in my prayer, partly because she's just a normal person like you or me. And I realise I don't have to be someone special to be great at prayer. I can just be me. And what Esther's realised and what makes prayer so extraordinary is not who's praying, but who they're praying to. This is Buckingham Palace. It's one of the most famous buildings in London, probably the world. And it's the main home of the King. Much as I'd like to meet him though, that's not going to happen. The gates are closed, I've not been invited and ordinary people don't just walk into Buckingham Palace. Imagine how you'd feel if you were invited though, or if you had the chance to meet someone else famous and inspiring, a world leader or film star. It'd be a big deal for me. The date would go in my diary, I'd rearrange everything else I had planned, and I'd probably be boring my friends and family for years to come with stories of the big day. And yet, every day, I am invited to spend time with someone far more amazing than the king. God. And I think one of the reasons why so many of us struggle in our prayer lives is that we've never really grasped the glory and greatness of what it means to pray. When we pray, we talk to God. God, the creator and ruler of everything that exists. Holy, eternal, almighty God. He wants to talk to you, to hang out to chat because that's what prayer is chatting with God when the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray he taught them to pray to God as our father when you pray say father it's the opening word of the Lord's prayer but it's also something of a signature phrase and heartbeat for all of Jesus's teaching on prayer because of Jesus, we can be in a relationship with God where we can call him Father. And there's a beautiful intimacy in that word. In Aramaic, the language Jesus spoke, it would have been Abba, Father, even Daddy. And it's a word of relationship, of closeness, of easy access. Prayer isn't just an obligation, a religious duty or a means to an end. It's first and foremost relational, chatting to our Heavenly Father. And yet, ironically, that intimacy can often blind us to the glory of what's going on. Because there's nothing small or childish about that word, Abba, Father. And alongside the intimacy, there's a glorious power and privilege in our prayer that we could easily miss. The one that we pray to as Abba is also our Father in heaven, God Almighty. And that means that prayer is the most awesome and powerful thing that you or I will ever do. I may not have access to Buckingham Palace to meet the King, but when it comes to God, his Lord and King, well, the gates of heaven are flung wide open for me whenever I want. Wow. When I was talking to Esther, this was one of the things she came back to again and again. Do you find prayer easy? Yes. How? It's a conversation with God. <laughs> it's a conversation with a friend. So, I mean, for example, um, when I'm with my, um, my um, girlfriends, I talk about everything from fashion to makeup to, to boys, <laughs> hair, which I don't have any of now, <laughs> so I had to shave off, um, all sorts of stuff. And you just flow. You just have a conversation and you have a laugh. You know, has God ever tickled you and said something so funny that you find yourself in your prayer time laughing all day? It's funny. So imagine when you, when you, and you're having a really good conversation with friends 
and the joy of having that conversation, the laughter, the big laugh that comes out of your belly. It's like that. It doesn't have to be solemn. It doesn't have to be sad. It doesn't have to be, you know, like a, you know, like a drag. It can be fun. I'm not saying that there are not times when I haven't cried in prayer. I haven't found it really like you're really pushing. You, you're working that muscle. You're pushing, you're pushing, you're pushing. We keep pushing because he never promised us easy. But he did say that I will be there with you. And we really need to get it that when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we're not on our own. God is always with us. He will never abandon us. He will never leave us. So we keep pushing. So yeah, just as you talk with your friends, have that conversation with God. Talk about whatever it is you, you want to talk with your friend. He's, he's holy. He's also father. He's dad. He's a friend. He says, I no longer call, um, um, call you slaves. I call you friends. He's a friend. All our prayers are rooted in our relationship with God. But we are then encouraged to ask for stuff as well. That probably shouldn't surprise anyone who's ever seen a small child asking their daddy for something. And the rest of the Lord's Prayer is mostly a series of requests. And some of it is focused on the things of God, as we pray, hallowed be your name, or your kingdom come. But lots of it is also about us, asking for protection against evil and temptation asking for forgiveness, or simply asking for the general necessities of life as we pray, give us today our daily bread. And it's this theme of asking that Jesus then focuses in on in the rest of his teaching on prayer in Luke 11. He tells a short parable and then sums it all up with the famous words, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Jesus is encouraging us to ask for things in prayer and then telling us that if we do, we can expect to receive them. And that can be practical things. He goes on to use an illustration of a child asking their dad for food, or it can be more intangible. The section actually finishes with Jesus promising that your Father in heaven will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Some of the most amazing answers to prayer are actually found in God's presence and help, even as we walk in the darkest moments of life. And interestingly to me, this is one of the roots of Esther's passion for prayer. As she prayed through a long season of racism, victimisation and bullying at work, why do you think you're more excited about prayer than other people? I think I'm more excited about prayer um, is because of, I think it's because mostly of what happened to me years ago and because of seeing God answer my prayer. And the way that God answered my prayer wasn't the way that I was expecting. It was way better. It was far better. It was over the top better. And I remember I was just done one day and I remember just falling on the floor and I just cried out to God and I said, I said, I'm done. I said, if you don't, and I remember saying these words, J Jesus, do not pass me by. If you pass me by, I'll die. And, um, and that was the cry that I had in my spirit. I cried so much. Somebody said I sounded like a, like an animal. Like I was crying from such a depth of my spirit. I didn't sound human. I was crying so, so deeply, you know, like asking God to help me. And, um, and I just let go of everything. So seeing God so profoundly move my life and change my life through prayer makes me passionate. It tells me my prayers are powerful. It tells me that God listens. He hears the cries of our hearts. It tells me that God is not deaf <laughs> and God is not blind. And God is there. He's present through it all. I've come here to the Royal Albert Hall to bring one of Jesus' best-known miracles to life. The hall is one of London's most iconic venues for concerts and shows. But I've come here to illustrate a number, 5,000. That's the number of seats in the hall, but it's also the number of people that Jesus fed miraculously on one extraordinary afternoon. 
Starting with one small boy's packed lunch of bread and fish, he fed a vast crowd of 5,000 men, probably plus women and children. But how many is that? I've always found it hard to picture until I came here. And suddenly it comes alive as I imagine Jesus walking into a packed Royal Albert Hall and feeding them all. It's an amazing image. But can you imagine you doing it? Or me? Because that's the sort of thing that Jesus told his disciples that we should expect. On the night before he died, he said, whoever believes in me will do the works, the miracles I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these. I will do whatever you ask in my name. It's such a big promise, it's almost scary. Jesus told us to expect to see the same sorts of miracles that he did. Healing the sick, calming storms, raising the dead, or feeding thousands. In fact, Jesus actually said they will do even greater things than these. And it's easy to gloss over all this or assume it, it's not for me. But this is not a promise for some spiritual elite group. This is a promise for whoever, anyone, who believes in Jesus. And that's you and me. And all we have to do is ask in his name. Pray. Have you ever realised how amazing, how powerful prayer actually is? Let's move on to testimony. Testimonies! Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> I know you've seen some amazing <laughs> answers to prayer over the years. Um, can you tell us some stories? I can tell you some stories. Oh my goodness, I love testimonies. I used to be a part of the, uh, the leadership team of the Bethel Healing Rooms in, in Redding, California. So a first year student came and she was crying and she had an Auntie Cynthia, who they call Auntie Cindy, that was in a home and they'd been told that she was not gonna make it past that day. She had had MS for 30 years and she was end stage. And um, they wanted me to Skype into her hospital room. So I was like, of course. So she made the phone call. There was a, a family member there. We Skyped in to the hospital room. And what I saw was Auntie Cindy was lying on a bed and she was a different color, she was gray. And um, she looked still, she wasn't moving. She looked like she was dead and she was under covers already. And um, backtrack 24 hours earlier was a Friday morning. I woke up Friday morning singing, I've got a river of life flowing out of me. So we go forward 24 hours. Here is Auntie Cindy lying on this bed and on the screen. And I thought, dear Lord, this, I mean, I've got nothing like, but God, you know. So I put my hand on the screen over her picture, you know, on the screen, and I just began to pray. And I just began to call life and healing and health to her body and prayed, nothing happened. And suddenly I heard in my head, I've got a river of life flowing out of me. So I said, hey, Auntie Cindy, I have a song for you. She's not, she's unresponsive. And I sang the song first time, and I sang the song second time. And at the second time I sang the song, out comes out of my mouth, hey, Cindy, get out of that deathbed and walk. Literally just came out of my mouth. Not planned, didn't know I was gonna say it, nothing, just came out of my mouth. And the next thing, she moved. The nurse went, like she put her hand on her head and her mouth was open. And then the niece that was standing right there with started shouting, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. She moved and I said, Cindy, get up, get up, get up. So I called the nurse who was now afraid to come and touch her. Come and help her, get up. And she moves the covers and she takes little steps and her legs just get stronger and I'm watching this. I could hardly see because I was crying so much. And she walks across to the other side of the room. There was a wheelchair there. She stood next to the wheelchair. She turned around and her entire face had changed. Oh, wow. 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 
When I hear testimonies like that, prayer no longer seems small or hard or boring, but exciting and full of possibility. And of course, there are challenges, such as when it seems as though our prayers haven't been answered. And we will look at those in due course. But I think that we need our faith and expectations around prayer to be expanded and to catch a fresh glimpse and vision of what prayer really is. It's easy to say, that's just Esther. She's great at prayer. But actually, this is for you and me too. And what makes prayer work is not the person praying, but the person they're praying to. Esther can't do all that, but God can. And if you believe in Jesus, that God is now your Abba, Father. And he wants to chat to you. And he wants you to ask him for things in prayer, whether they're small, like a kid asking for something little from their dad, or huge, like a woman walking off her deathbed, completely healed of MS. So as we finish, can I pray for you? Abba, Father, I want to pray for those watching and pray that you would inspire and help them in their prayers. Make them want to pray more. Meet them and help them when they do pray and answer them when they ask. In Jesus' name, Amen.